Very happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation for uh, talking at this very uh, interesting uh, summer school about logic and rationality, subject I've been working on since uh, many years. Okay, so the, the title of my talk is Can Logic Make Us More Rational? Let's see how we can understand this question. First of all, I would like to remember the origin of uh, logic. I've, I am uh, quite uh, interested in the, in the history of logic, and uh, I think it's good to know a few things about that. So, in Greek, we have this word logos, and as we know, logic comes from logos, and this is the word that we are using in English, French, German, Portuguese, and so on. And the, the word logos in Greek has four, more, four important meanings that you can see here. It's science, reasoning, language, and relation. Relation is not necessary. The, sometimes people don't know exactly why relation, what does it mean? Uh, we will try to talk about that. So uh, let me uh, give you a quotation by Rougier. Uh, it's uh, in French, but it's a, his book is not translated in English, but I tried to make a translation about what to say about Logos. The Logos is the creation of the Greek genius in the science, arts, moral, and politics. And the Logos means at the same time discourse, reason, reasoning, relation, and proportion. So I think it's very important to have this in mind uh, when we are talking about logic and rationality, because uh, as you can see here, uh, reasoning appear, rationality appear uh, as a, as a, in various ways here through science, relation, ratio, and uh, logic, of course. Start. I, have, uh, I would like to um, explain this difference. So it's a difference which is very important that I've been uh, developing since a couple of years. Difference between two uh, meanings of logic. Okay. I make a kind of joke because uh, we, I will use two different words with only a, a slight change. Logic with a small L and logic with a big L. I will explain to you why it's a good way to make the difference in the linguistic way. Okay. So logic with a capital L. By logic with a capital L, I mean here reasoning in a very wide sense of the, of the word. Reasoning. And then logic with a small L is a theory of reasoning. And it's very important to make this distinction. And by the theory of reasoning, inside this theory of reasoning, the, the theory of, this theory of reasoning can take take uh, many different shapes, but uh, we can make a description of this fear of reasoning talking about, uh, for example, systems of logic. So we have a lot of different systems of logic. S s at the beginning, the system by, of Aristotle, syllogistics, and now uh, in modern logic, first order classical logic, and a lot of non-classical logic, fuzzy logic, par constant logic. I have been working on par constant logic especially, so I will talk about that. So, uh, we have to keep in mind this distinction. Okay. Let's see, um, discussion was famous at, so, at some point yeah, in Berkeley, California. You know, you have these two guys, uh, William Kahn and Lotfi Zadeh. And uh, so Lotfi Zadeh is very famous as a promoter of fuzzy logic. And uh, on the other side, you have a computer scientist, William Kahn. You see the picture here. And uh, when uh, they, they start to develop fuzzy logic and it was quite a success, um, Khan was a bit irritated by that. And he wrote the following to that it's a personal letter, which is quite famous, saying that uh, fuzzy is something wrong. Okay. We need, what we need is more logical thinking, not less. And so on. So uh, if we want to understand this uh, discussion, it's good to understand it from this point of view of the distinction between fear of reasoning and reasoning itself. Let me try to explain that. For example, from the point of view of uh, fuzzy logic, Kahn 
what is uh, what can want to say? He wants to say for him. I, I try to summarize his position. Logic formulating using this distinction between logic with a big hell and logic with a small hell. So logic should not be fuzzy. So you see there is kind of normative approach here. So reasoning itself should not be fuzzy. Therefore, logic with a small hell, I mean, system of logic, theory of logic should not be fuzzy because we want to, to, to develop reasoning which is not fuzzy. And we have no reason when developing this kind of uh, theory of reasoning to use a fuzzy logic as a system of logic. On the other hand, what is exactly the position of Zade? It's not completely clear, but we can say, well, for him, logic is fuzzy. Reasoning is fuzzy, and maybe reality is fuzzy. And for this reason, and for him, this is not bad, and uh, for this reason, we should develop fuzzy logic. We should have a theory of uh, reasoning, which is a fuzzy logic system. This is uh, the way that we can understand this discussion. Now another question um, about relation between the uh, theory of reason, system of logic. Nowadays, since uh, many years, uh, what people learn at school, I mean at university, in philosophy department in particular, in particular what they learn is classical proposal logic, and uh, one of the m very famous tools is the uh, truth table. So I think everybody has heard about truth table, have already seen a truth table, and so on. So here we have a truth table, and it's a system. A truth table is a system. It's related to a system of logic, classical proposal logic. It's a way to present classical proposal logic. Now, uh, if we want to use the word truth, I will not speak too much about truth today, but it's also very important, truth and reasoning. So can we say that truth table is useful to reach the truth? Truth, No. And there was a lot of discussion at the beginning of the 20th century about that. And here, also, again, we have this distinction between system and reach the truth. It's reasoning in the way that we are going from truth to truth. Okay, now let me uh, give interesting uh, quotation by a famous uh, philosopher to uh, see um, in which sense they understand logic if they are making this distinction between uh, reasoning and theory of reasoning, you will see. So, uh, you see here I, I, wrote, um, I wrote logic with a lambda. It's like a variable. It can be big L, it can be small L. So logic as conceived by great thinkers, sometimes it's more reasoning, some, sometimes it's more theory of reasoning, as you will see. Sometimes it's quite ambiguous. So there is this very famous uh, quotation <coughs> by Locke, logic is anatomy of thought. Of course, here, here I put capital L because it's the first uh, word of the sentence, but when, when Locke says that, uh, what, what does it mean? Is he talking about reasoning or about theory of reasoning? It's not clear in the sense that anatomy itself is not something which has a clear meaning. But now uh, there is this very famous quotation from the <coughs> preface of the second edition of the Critique of Pure Reason by Kant. Well, and he says uh, that logic has advanced in this short course even from the earliest time is apparent from the fact that since Aristotle, it has been unable to advance a step and thus to all appearance has reached its completion. Well, <coughs> Of course, uh, it's clear that here Kant is talking about logic with a small l. He's, he's talking about the theory of reason, not reasoning itself. Now let's see uh, Boole, which can be uh, considered in many ways as the founder of modern logic. In his book of, uh, famous book, Law of Thought, he wrote the following. The design of the following treatise is to investigate the fundamental laws of those operations of the mind by which reasoning is performed, to give expression to them in the symbolic language of a calculus, and upon this foundation to establish the science of logic. So uh, when uh, Bull is talking here about the science of logic, he's talking about the science of reasoning. So he's, in some sense, he's making the distinction because he's, he's saying, well, we are talking about the science of logic. Science of logic, science of reasoning. Now, uh, there is a quotation by um, Sorris Carroll, uh, as maybe people know, 
uh, was a logician. Uh, he wrote several books about uh, logic, symbolic logic. And uh, there is this quotation by uh, uh, his book, uh, uh, this is this quotation by Lewis Carroll, uh, Quine chose to, put, uh, chose to put this quotation at the beginning of his book, Philosophy of Logic, which is a very famous book, Philosophy of Logic. Well, we can wonder why Quine uh, uh, decided to choose this uh, sentence. I don't think, uh, we don't know, maybe it's just because it's literally with Carroll or something like that. But if we want to, if we read this sentence by Lewis Carroll, well, that's logic. Because I write was so, it might be. And if it were so, it should be. As it isn't, it ain't. That's logic. Well, it seems that here, uh, Lewis Carroll is describing a kind of way of reasoning. So he's not talking about logic as a theory of reasoning. He's talking about reasoning itself. Okay. And I think Quine was aware of that. Yeah. But maybe Quine uh, liked this sentence because it seems that it's a kind of classical reasoning, and so classical logic is the same as reasoning. We can interpret this in this way. I mean. Now, um, more uh, quotation, one by Peirce also, which is a very famous uh, man in the development of modern logic. And his interesting quotation, where he says, bad reasoning as well as good reasoning is possible. And the fact, this fact is the foundation of the practical side of logic. So here we have practical side of logic. He's talking about logic as a, as a kind of normative science of reasoning, something like that. This is the way that we can interpret. Now, a strange uh, quotation by Wittgenstein, also a famous logician. This is, uh, by the way, this photography is uh, the house designed by Wittgenstein in Vienna. Um, well, and so uh, logic takes care of itself, and all we have to do is to look and to see how it does it. Well, in this sense, uh, we can interpret, it can, this can look, may look strange, but if we, if we, um, understood logic as reasoning itself, is that's not necessarily so problematic. Now, uh, if we look at a quotation like this one by uh, Saint-Exupéry, pure logic is the reign of the spirit. Well, here, Saint-Exupéry is talking about reasoning by opposition to something more emotional or something more literature. Again, Rougier. Uh, okay, uh, what the following? With the discovery of the conventional and relative character of logic, human spirit has burned its last idol. Well, when uh, Rouget is talking about that, what is relative here? I will talk uh, again about this later on today. Is it the reasoning itself or is it, is it the fear of reasoning? Well, we can understand that it's reasoning itself. Reasoning itself. Uh, there is no special law uh, in uh, not as a science, but as a process of human reasoning in his mind or his brain or anything like that. And the, the last quotation, uh, which is uh, interesting because it's related to his logic and reality. So uh, we know that uh, the development of uh, quantum physics has led to some um, change in logic, people have tried to develop new logic for that. And then the, the idea there is to develop a new logic to have a better understanding of, of reality. And uh, you have this quotation by uh, Heisenberg where what he's saying is that uh, maybe we have to change our logic to have a better understanding of reality. And I guess here it's not necessarily clear if he's talking about reasoning itself or the theory of reasoning of a mix of the two. So summarizing, you see that uh, um, this distinction between logic as reasoning, logic as theory of reasoning, much of the time is not clear. And I think this is important to make this distinction. Let me explain why I choose uh, this, uh, to express this distinction with a big L and, uh, and a small L. Because it's what happened in, um, in history. This is uh, over cases, I don't know over cases, but this one is famous. So in English, also in French, uh, we, people who use these two uh, different way of writing, history with a small h and history with a big h. And history with a big h is the series of events which are studied by the science, which is called history with a small 
age, sometimes historical science or historiography or something like that. So that's why I make, I use this, uh, I decide to make this uh, same, this, to express the difference between reasoning and theory of reasoning with this uh, small m and capital, so it's easy to remember. Okay. Most of the time, if we look at the science and its object of study, we have a difference, we have different name for that. For, uh, we say well, uh, biology is a science of living organism, physics, the science of matter, linguistics, the science of language, and so on. So generally, there are two different worlds. Okay. Of course, there is some variation because at, at, the, at the start, physics, in Greek, was the name. There was no difference because uh, the word physics was also the, the subject matter of the science of physics. Okay, so you see, here we are making a distinction. Now if you ask uh, some, what is the subject matter of logic? It's not clear because, you know, people are not making this, this distinction. Well, someone may say logic is a study of reasoning, something like that. This is what, uh, this, is, this is a general idea, the study of reasoning. But sometimes people use the word logic as a synonym to, uh, re to reasoning. What we can say is that in both cases, uh, I would make a more comparison between these two situations, um, logic is not logic, history is not history. This is clear, even though even we are using some words which are very similar. But uh, one, one of the reasons we are using the same word is because there is a strong connection between the two. I think that's the reason. So, uh, if you ask, uh, when did history start? I'm talking here history with a big H. But it's not clear. There are different uh, answers. Someone may say at the end of prehistory, because people are making distinction between two stages, okay, history, prehistory. Some people may argue that history started when history started. This has been argued by different people. So the people say, well, at the time uh, in Greece where people like, uh, to see did, and these people were the first historians, then start reading history. This is a provocative statement, but it can make sense. Well, and then uh, we can say at the year zero, since zero, zero is the first uh, number, natural number, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> if we want to make a connection between uh, history of and numbers. Okay. Well, I'm saying I'm saying this as a kind of joke because people may say, "Well, history starts when uh, Jesus Christ was born." Yeah. Well, and then uh, when did logic start? We can make a similar uh, comparison at the end of mythology. If you want to make a parallel between the two, so there was mythology, and then start science, you know, reasoning and things like that. If we if we understand logic in a very wide sense of the logos. And someone may say, logic start when logic started. And this, in fact, most of the people say something like that, you know, because people say, well, logic started with Aristotle. Why? Because Aristotle was the first to make a uh, theory of uh, reasoning. But we can ask the question, is it true that because of that, people start to reason? Maybe not. Maybe, maybe people were reasoning before. And if we want to use uh, mathematics, we can talk about uh, Aleph Zero, which was uh, the, f the new beginning of uh, logic in the 19th century with the transfinite numbers and so on. So let's come back to Aristotle. So uh, if you ask someone, uh, well, you ask if Aristotle is the creator of logic, most of the people will say yes. Because uh, of this, uh, because I understand logic as a theory of freedom. But on the other hand, uh, most of the people agree that Aristotle was not the first to reason, to have a logic in this sense. Even Aristotle himself, you know, because uh, Aristotle uh, was one of the promoters of the definition of human beings as a rational animal, in Greek, a logical animal. So if uh, human beings are conceived as, uh, as logical animal, they were logical since the start, you know. There was no change. But this can be, uh, we can have, uh, using this distinction between reasoning and theory of reasoning, in fact, we can have a completely uh, different vision about the story. Because 
um, I have been studying the, the history of uh, mathematics and so on in Greece. And uh, what we know is that at some point in the school of Pythagoras, um, people start to use uh, the addiction to the absurd. And this was a completely change in mathematics. Some people say that the start, the real beginning of mathematics is the first proof using the addiction to the absurd, uh, which is a proof that square root of two is not rational. So these people uh, in mathematics, in Greek mathematics, they start to reason in a different way. So maybe we can argue, well, this, is, this was a real start of reasoning. It's not, uh, there is no uh, known uh, apparent manifestation of this addiction to the absurd before this time in Greece or in another location on, on the earth. So uh, we can identify, if we identify the first use of reduction to the absurd with the beginning of mathematics, we can also say that uh, it's, a, it's a beginning of logic with a big hair. And this was many years, I mean, not so many years, but years before Aristotle. And what happened in Greece is that uh, Aristotle, when he developed uh, syllogistic, he didn't describe uh, the addiction to the absurd, at least not directly, very indirectly, and he was not specially interested in uh, mathematical reasoning. He's very famous, but, so this is in some sense this is a weak point, but the good point is that uh, Aristotle was interested in all kinds of reasoning, so he, has, uh, he had a very universal approach to reasoning. Reasoning, and he was a promoter, the main promoter of the idea that the validity of a reasoning is, independently, is independent of uh, the topic uh, we are reasoning about. This is a very important point in the development of uh, logic with Aristotle. So this, this, uh, I mean, this independence between the form of the reasoning and the contents, uh, we don't know if Aristotle was maybe the first to, to make a theory about that. But people in Greece were practicing this kind of valid, uh, valid argument in a, where there was this independence between uh, the form and the content. Because uh, if we remember Plato, well, when he put this uh, famous, famous uh, motto at the entrance of the academy that people uh, should know geometry, the, his main idea was people, uh, if people want to go on to develop their study, they know how to reason. Okay, but you can then apply this uh, methodology of reasoning of mathematics to any kind of subject, and this is, of course, what I try to do uh, about all the important fundamental notion of uh, philosophy. Well, now, uh, so the logic of Aristotle, his theory of, uh, his system of logic, syllogistic, was the main system during uh, many centuries, People were learning this at school, but at some point, uh, people decide to completely reject this, and uh, most famous were Descartes and Pascal. It is very interesting to remember that, because we have here this paradox. You know, people say Descartes is Cartesian, someone is very Cartesian, and something like that. It means it's someone who is, who is very rational, very logic, and so on. But Descartes was against logic, logic, with a small l, uh, as a theory of reasoning, because his idea uh, is, was that uh, we don't need a theory, we don't, we don't really need to apply some rules to develop our reasoning. Uh, it's a very famous sentence, the um, bon sens, la chose la mieux partagée du monde, means, well, uh, we have this capacity of reasoning, of course, you can, we can improve it and we will give some ideas with this rule for the direction of the mind and also in the discord method. But his idea is that to use syllogistic is completely wrong. And if we use syllogistic, we, instead of improving our reasoning, we will uh, turn our reasoning in a way, uh, it, will, <coughs> it will be a kind of obstacle to develop science. So uh, here um, I have to make a, a, a table of the, the four main precept of uh, methodology of Descartes that you can find in his work, it's very famous, clarity, division, ascension, exhaustivity. So that's the idea of Descartes. So it's not to make a system of logic. 
It's uh, to promote good reasoning through some very general methodology. But it's, in some sense, it's also a kind of theory. I mean, if we, if we can say it's a kind of logic, not a system of logic. But it's a kind of theory of reasoning. Now, if we look at Pascal, which was more or less at the same time, he had some very uh, ideas, so, but Pascal was more like a mathematician in, his, in general. So, um, he will put some rules which are very close to modern mathematics. Here he has a famous quotation by uh, Pascal. It's a bit difficult to translate it in English. Je ne plus jamais du nom pourvu qu'on m'avertisse du sens qu'on lui donne. It's a very mathematical way to think, you know, because uh, by, doing, by saying that, Pascal uh, was criticizing people that spend all their, all their time in the discussion to say, well, uh, this means that, this means that, and so on. So they were too close to the language. And this, uh, he didn't like that. And so he had a very much more general abstract idea of how to proceed. The fact that we can choose arbitrary name. And this is completely typical of uh, modern mathematics. Uh, Hilbert promoted this. You know, he said, well, in geometry, instead of uh, talking about line and point, you can talk about beer and wurst or something like that. I don't remember exactly the quotation, but, and he says the name doesn't, it's not important because we can understand, we can interpret, we have a, a, a definition, an axiom, and then we can interpret this. The meaning of the, of the notion depends on this, the axiom and definition. So here we have eight rules. They, they are not stated explicitly like a uh, table like that, but it's not difficult to, to draw this table when you uh, uh, read this small book by Pascal, The Spirit of Geometry. And this rule are completely, has, has been completely adopted by uh, modern logicians, and especially uh, Alfred Tarski, uh, was very uh, fond of uh, Pascal. So he, he wrote a paper about that, but uh, in the 30s something, he wrote a paper about what is deduction and so on. And he repeats all these ideas, and insisting of the fact that we can uh, go in a completely arbitrary way. Well, this is uh, general ideas. But once again, here we don't really have a system of logic. So Pascal was also criticizing quite a lot uh, syllogistic. He wanted to replace this, uh, this system by some general rules. Now, if we look at uh, what happened in the development of logic in Poland, we have some sim similar thing because, you know, they like the Polish people, they like to use this expression, methodology of deductive science. So they have some general, uh, <coughs> they have some general uh, principle like this one by Pascal. But then from that, they start to develop some uh, more specific systems of mathematics and also of logic. Now, um, Let's go to the, the beginning of uh, modern logic with Boole. So, as we know, there is no strong opposition between Boole and traditional logic because Boole was not against, uh, he was not against uh, syllogistic. The difference between uh, someone like Kant and Boole is that we can say, well, for Kant, reasoning it will be always the same. And since the theory of uh, Aristotle is a good description of this reasoning, so everything is already closed. On the other hand, uh, Bull had the idea that reasoning will be always the same, but he wanted to give a better description of reasoning of the theory of syllogists of Aristotle. And by doing that, he started to make a lot, uh, even if it was not his intention to change this theory, he started to uh, make a lot of change. Here uh, we have seen quotation by the wife of Bull, who was also a mathematician. Uh, Bull died quite young, and then uh, his wife going, was going on to write some books about this general approach of uh, George Bull because they were working together. Um, so it's interesting, she said, many people think that it's impossible to make algebra about anything except number. This is a complete mistake. The use of algebra is to free people from bondage. But we have to understand what kind of, about what kind of algebra they are talking about. This is how we try to explain. So this is uh, the change, the basic change in, the, in modern logic is the introduction, is a mathematization of logic. And this is why it's very interesting. Because mathematics is considered since uh, many centuries and up to now is considered as one of the highest form of reasoning. Okay. Now, 
if we want to understand uh, reasoning, why not we have to reason? Why not using mathematics? That was the, the idea of Wool. And this idea that uh, we can generalize algebra is not only about quantity numbers, but we can apply this methodology of symbolic algebra, which was developed by Peacock and Gregory at the beginning of the 19th century. We can apply this methodology to understand what is reasoning. So there is, a, uh, there is this interesting proposition four in chapter three of uh, the law of thought, where uh, Bull uh, wrote the following. The it's a proposition, and he has a proof of, of this proposition. The principle of non-contradiction is a consequence of the fundamental law of thought whose expression is x2 is x equal to s. x2 is equal to s to x. Now, uh, it's very interesting because uh, since uh, the time of Aristotle, people were considering that principle of non-contradiction was a fundamental law of logic. We have to understand in which sense. But it's very famous. And Bull, for him, it's possible to deduce this principle of non-contradiction for, from what he, calls, what he calls here the fundamental law of thought. Now, if you ask someone why this is a fundamental law of thought, in principle, nobody will understand in which why this should be a fundamental law of thought. Very strange. Yeah. So, uh, and if you ask someone uh, to, pr to make this proof of this proposition, now it's not clear that people will be able to, to make this proof. Proof is not very difficult, it's three lines. But it's a question of presentation, how we can understand the principle of the contradiction. But it's uh, funny, this uh, proposition four uh, of Bull, because it remember uh, this uh, discussion between uh, Ole and Diderot in St. Peter's uh, it's famous that uh, Diderot went to St. Petersburg, he was invited there, and a very famous mathematician who was working in uh, St. Petersburg, and Diderot started to talk about religion, so he was an uh, atheist, and at some point, uh, earlier presented this equation, say, from this, uh, hence God exists, and then Diderot had to come back to France, because he was not able to reply, why, why not? So it's funny because it's, uh, we, have, we can make a parallel between this and uh, Bull because it's a connection between two things to which are not necessarily clear. You, know, we have, you have a principle of some contradictions that for many people is something more like metaphysical, ontological, and on the other hand, you have an equation. How we can establish a relation of these two things, how we can deduce one from another one. So I, make a, I try to replicate the history um, between uh, Bull and Marx. So as we know, Marx was in England at the time of Bull. And then we can apply this uh, equation to a contradiction. As we know that in the Marxian theory, contradiction is very important. But uh, according to Bull, there are no contradiction. OK. Now, uh, let me say a few words about the different terminology which was used to talk about uh, modern logic. So I'm um, trying to make a list here. Nowadays, we can talk simply about logic, but this different expression, like methodology of deductive science, was popular in Poland. Metamathematics was promoted by Hilbert, and we have symbolic algebra and formal logic, and so this, 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 It's interesting to have a look at this different expression because it shows different way to understand what is logic. As a theory, I mean, as a kind of theory, but sometimes the name is changing uh, because of the way that the theory is uh, manifesting. So the expression symbolic logic, I will not talk too much about this today because it's a long story, but just to remember that symbolic logic, the expression is a derivation of symbolic algebra, and there is a special meaning of that. And then after, after this period of Bull, it was, uni it was used in a different way by John Vane and the Association for Symbolic Logic, which is the main association of logic, a journal of symbolic logic. The name is a bit weird. Is a bit weird but now, uh, I would like to talk more about formal logic, the meaning of formal. Because uh, the expression formal, uh, formal logic was introduced by Kant. Uh, but it's strange, so it's strange to use the expression uh, formal logic to talk about uh, modern logic, because as we have seen, uh, Kant were just saying, well, uh, the logistic is good, there will be nothing new in the future. 
So why using this expression formal logic to talk about something which is against Kant, I mean, modern logic? There are different meanings of this expression. And the first is the uh, original, uh, I mean, this uh, important distinction of Aristotle, the so-called ilemorphism. Well, this idea of Aristotle, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's related to all his uh, philosophy, this ilemorphism, so it's something we can say, well, it's really something related with Aristotle. It's still, uh, so there is no change, what I want to say is there is no change between this conception of uh, formal logic at the time of Aristotle and at the time of modern logic. But now uh, we can, uh, uh, there are different, ex the, the expression formal logic is used in different way, like uh, people, formalists, the famous formalist, this expression is used to talk about tendency in modern logic, Hilbert and so on, formalist school. So here we have, I, I wrote a paper about this, making the distinction between five meanings of formal. So it's very, so we can see that this expression is very ambiguous. Now if we keep in mind the, the first point, there is no strong difference between uh, modern logic and logic of Aristotle. What we can say, and it's very easy to understand, is that uh, Aristotle made the distinction between the form of reasoning and the content of reasoning, and he said, well, the validity of reasoning is dependent of the, the content, this is still the way to, to, to think about logic nowadays as a theory of reasoning and as a way of reasoning in modern logic. But what has changed is the, the characterization of the form, logical form. Well, so, uh, and it's, but there are some uh, important distinctions. Why? Because Barbara, you know, it's uh, famous, <laughs> the most famous uh, figure of logistics. Everybody has heard about her. Well, Barbara. So, uh, what is the main idea of the theory of Aristotle? I would say, in fact, that um, the syllogistic is not only a theory of reasoning, because uh, it, since it's normative, uh, Aristotle wants to promote a good way of reasoning. There is not real, a real distinction at this point about the theory and uh, the reality of reasoning, because we should reason like that. But the main point of uh, syllogistic is that um, there is something that disappears. It's a middle term. So this is the main uh, feature of syllogistic. You relate, you succeed to relate two notions by a third notion that disappear. So it's very interesting from the philosophical point of view, this, uh, this conception of uh, a system of logic. But in modern logic, there was something, something which was, was developed, which is connected with that, but then uh, Barbara will disappear. Well, this, uh, this logician here is not so famous but, uh, nowadays, but he was famous at some point, Paul Hertz. Uh, he was also a physicist, but it's not the same as the famous guy from the Hertz, uh, the most famous one, but it's quite a common name in Germany. Hertz. So, Paul Hertz, well, he developed a system uh, of logic. He was uh, working at Göttingen at some point. He developed a system of logic where, uh, in the 20s, where there is a rule in the system that he decided to call cut in German. But at the same time, uh, he was also calling this rule modus barbara because for him it was a kind of modern presentation of this uh, world of syllogistics. So, Hertz himself was not against uh, Barbar. Uh, on the contrary, he presents this system of logic, which is called that system in German, which means just system of propositions, something like that. And he decided to put some three rules on the three rules, and one of them was uh, cut, and he called it Barbar. Unfortunately, most of the book of the writing by Hertz are not yet translated in English. But I quote the original, Nerketnis. We'll talk about that. Well, but when, what happened next? So, um, Gensen was uh, also working in the same school in Göttingen. Uh, he started to do his research by reading the paper by Hertz. 
at the end of the 20s. He formulated uh, the system of Hertz in a different way, but not completely different, but slightly different. This is the cut rules as uh, formulated by, by Gensen. So you see that the, uh, the uh, Gensen creates something which is called nowadays sequence calculus or sequence system. Why? Because these later years, they are sequence of formula. Okay, this is a sequence of formula, this is a sequence of formula, this is one formula. Okay, so what you see in this cut rule is that one, this formula A, they simply disappear. Okay, disappear. This is the, why it's called cut, because it's cut in some sense. Well, and uh, what, but what was the important step by Gensen? That he proved this uh, cut elimination theorem, which is one of the most important theorem of, uh, of modern uh, logic. We can say uh, top five, <laughs> something like that. Well, and uh, from this cut elimination theorem, as a corollary of this cut elimination theorem, he proved the consistency of arithmetics, just uh, after the result by Gödel. And of course, it's a relative consistency, but it's a consistency of arithmetics. And uh, Gödel had good contact with the work of Gensen. He spends many years stu studying the work of Gensen about that, and he made also some proof of consistency based on this idea. But what, so what is, uh, I will not talk about that today, but I want to explain what is a cut elimination theorem and what is important from the philosophical point of view. Well, you see, if you look at the system of Aristotle's syllogistic, all rules of the syllogistic are rules where something is a pure middle term. So they all are a form of cut. Now what, uh, what uh, Gensen did after, on the basis of the work of Hertz, he constructed a system where only one, the, the cut uh, appears only in one rule, and there is no cut in the other rules, okay? And then, he proved that it's possible to uh, make it, to have exactly the same results using this rule or not. That's why it's called elimination. And this is very surprising. Very surprising because at the end, what, uh, Gensen showed is that we don't need this rule. We don't need to cut anything. And uh, this is completely uh, uh, opposed to Aristotle. So the, one of the first uh, consequences of uh, the cut elimination theorem by Gensen is what we can call analysis. Because if you want to prove something, you have a formula, as, uh, I mean, uh, in mathematics, can we deduce uh, such something like uh, Fermat theorem from the axiom of arithmetics? What the theorem of what, what the theorem of Gensen is saying is that you don't need to use something outside of these formulas to prove the results. That's why we can call it analytic. Okay, now uh, to finish my talk because time is gone, I will say a about the square of opposition, uh, which also I think is a very interesting to topic relating um, classical uh, modern logic and uh, functional logic. So here uh, you have the you have uh, the, the syllogism of Barbar on the right and on the on the left uh, the Baroque syllogism, and uh, you can understand the relation between these two syllogisms by the notion of contradiction, which is one of the main notion of contradiction of opposition in the in this square of opposition, which was in itself not developed by uh, Aristotle but was based on some idea of Aristotle especially the distinction between contradiction and contrariety. So Aristotle made this distinction, and after some centuries, Apuleius uh, and Boeus, they designed this square, which explains the relation between four uh, propositions using this free notion of, of opposition. Well, there is a discussion to know if it's square of opposition, it's part of syllogistic and so on. Well, I will not enter in this kind of detail, but what we know is that uh, these people like uh, Apuleius and Boethius, they, they made a synthesis of syllogistic with the square of opposition. So it's, uh, it's a theory of reasoning in some sense. And uh, this theory was developed further on in the, 19th, in the 20th century by Robert Blanchet with his book Structure Intellectuelle et ses Organisations Systématiques des Concepts. So I will say a few words about this work and this will be the end of my talk. So what Blanchet did, so this book, uh, 
uh, is sometimes it was not so well known nowadays people start to, 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 to study it again it does not been translated in, in English but Blanchet in France is very uh, famous so what it is well uh, Blanchet, uh, by, uh, he, will, uh, he will present uh, an hexagon, which is a uh, theory, which is more, which is a continuation of the square of opposition. It's a theory that will explain, that we can use to apply it to the understanding of many concepts. So let me give this example, very famous, which is a deontic hexagon. So with this theory, so in fact, uh, Blanchet started his work because he was interested in deontic logic and he was criticizing von Richt. And this led him to draw this, uh, to draw this hexagon, which uh, permits to make a distinction between these two notions, what is optional and what is allowed. Sometimes we can say permitted or something like that. And before uh, Blanchet, this distinction was not clear. So uh, what, and this hexagon also applied to quantifier. The same, Blanchet was able to make a distinction between two quantifiers which were most of the time confused. So uh, what can we say about that? Is that we, are, we have a theory, this theory of opposition, so it's a theory about uh, reasoning in a very general way because we have three notion of opposition and we will apply this free notion of definition of opposition to develop our, our reasoning, not only our reasoning in the, sen in the sense of making a proof, okay, but in the sense of having a better understanding of the distinction, relation between uh, different concepts. So it's a very wide way to understand reasoning. It's not just a formal system, but it's a theory. So, uh, and uh, we are organizing this, uh, I, will, I will finish with this um, announcement about work on of the square for opposition. So, we are uh, uh, organizing now the fifth edition in Easter Island, so everybody is welcome. It's a nice uh, location, I have a, here, poster, and see uh, was to the previous one in the Vatican two years ago. Thank you very much.